Good morning. I'm Don Waybright, the missions pastor at Sugar Creek Baptist Church. The theme for our mission focus into the next year is the statement, yes, Jesus is worth it. And that yes is the resounding answer to the question that we pose going into the missions banquet. Is Jesus worth it? Is Jesus worth uh, pushing the limits, getting uncomfortable, uh, dying to self in order to make the gospel known and plant the gospel seed in other people's lives? Is the idea of dying to self to produce new life? This is what we're talking about this morning. The Christian life is filled with such paradoxes. The first shall be last, love your enemy. You must die in order to live. And that's what we want to talk about this morning is this dying to self. The seed of life must die in order to produce more life. And this is the secret to living. What is up with that? You know, Jesus himself gives us this principle in John chapter 12, verses 24 through 26. He shares this hard statement just five days before he would be crucified. And then three days later, he'd rise from death in order to plant the seed of life in you and me. This is the words of Jesus, the resurrection and the life. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. And anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am. And we're seeing this principle of dying to self and the resulting harvest played out in our mission efforts. In fact, we're seeing and participating in an incredible harvest. Jesus spoke a lot about the kingdom of God from harvest terms, in terms of agricultural and farming uh, analogies. And the basis of all cultures is agriculture. So Jesus teaches about the basis of the culture of the kingdom of God, and he he uses picture stories or parables about agriculture, and he uses three such uh, picture stories in the book of Mark chapter 4, and we're going to take a look at three of those things briefly this morning. The first story you're very familiar with, it's the parable of the four soils. The seed of the gospel is sown in the empty field, and it lands on four different types of soil. That first soil, it takes no root, and Satan comes immediately and snatches it away. The second soil, the roots are very shallow, and when persecution and suffering come, they they wither and they can't withstand it. That third soil, well, that seed, that kind of looks like you come to church on Sunday, and you act like and you look like and you conform to the world on Monday. But the fourth soil, that's the good soil. That's the soil that accepts the gospel and the word of God and surrenders and yields and obey to his every word and his will. And it produces and multiplies fruit, a tremendous harvest. This is a soil, that forced soil, that dies to self and yields a great harvest that is pleasing to the living God. We sow the gospel seed broadly and passionately in our local and global mission efforts. And we sow on all soils But we are looking for that fourth soil, men and women, that God's already prepared for his harvest. Another key strategy focus for our mission is the next parable of that growing seed. This is in Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 29. And this is where we get the four field strategy that you may have heard about that is a framework of our missions, a framework of our disciple-making strategy around the world. Let's look at Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 29. The kingdom of God is like this, Jesus said. A man scatters seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, and he doesn't know how. The soil produces a crop by itself, first the blade, then the head, and then the ripe grain on the head. But as soon as the crop is ready, he sends for the sickle because the harvest has come. Here Jesus describes the organic approach to kingdom growth. And from this, we have derived our four-field strategy, which also describes the core missionary task of the church. 
And the core missionary task of the church is a reproducible entry strategy into the empty fields of lostness, a reproducible gospel strategy, a reproducible discipleship strategy, a reproducible church formation or group and gathering strategy, a reproducible leadership development strategy, and then a healthy exit plan with ongoing support and relationship. Did you see all that in that passage? In our gospel conversation trainings, one, two, and three. And by the way, you don't have to go to them sequentially. You can go to anyone at any time. But in that gospel conversation training, we're basically teaching the tools and the principles that are part of this four fields framework. You would learn them by going through that, that training. But the hidden mover behind all these tools and principles is the Holy Spirit. We can't manufacture nor program life change. We're not making trinkets. We're making disciples. We're not producing Coke or Pepsi. We're producing life change, changing the eternal destiny of men and women. And the beautiful mystery of all this is that Jesus chooses to use people like us, the church, to be the agents that transfer that seed from one life to the next. In fact, that seed cannot transfer to another person unless that seed dies to self. And it all begins with the serious work of prayer. We have extraordinary prayer in the mission of our church. This is the posture of our teams before God, our short-term mission teams. During their preparation time, they're trained in the understanding of the spirit life, what it means to be filled with and surrendered to the Holy Spirit, such that the Holy Spirit has complete control of their lives. And before they go on the field, they have this time of consecration where they, they completely surrender and yield to the, to the Holy Spirit and are filled with the Spirit. In fact, our, our short-term mission teams are a spiritual forma formation accelerator for our participants, and they're a kingdom accelerator for our ministry partners that receive these teams. Each of these teams will have a, a, a prayer support network of anywhere from 500 to 1,500 or more prayer supporters. There's a prayer coordinator that's giving each one of those 500 to 1,500 or more prayer supporters daily and specific prayer needs of that team while they're on the field. And while they're on the field, we have a group of people dedicated here at Sugar Creek that are praying and fasting every day that they're out on the field in the harvest. And since we began this approach several years ago, we've seen an exponential increase in fruit. For instance, in Delhi, India, the capital of India. In 2012, Sugar Creek adopted the mega city of Delhi, and we began to sow the seed and work the empty fields. And we sent lots of four fields equipped type of teams from our church. We would sow the seed and begin to disciple and train the four soil men and women for the harvest and teach them to do the same things that we modeled for them. We saw the hand of God do amazing things, and the multiplication began. In 2017, we were able to exit and turn that core missionary task that I mentioned earlier, we turned that over to a national team that would own that vision for the future. And we have a continuing relationship with that team. Now in Delhi, through that network, they average over 10,000 gospel shares a month. And they will see over 100 baptisms each month. In fact, last month they had 147 baptisms in the city of Delhi through that network. So we left Delhi, and we began the same strategy in Kathmandu, the capital city of Nepal. In 2018, last year, we started casting vision with a national team, forming that team, building strategy and alignment around our tools and, and principles. And then this year, we began sending well-equipped four fields type of teams from our church, about seven teams in whole. We set goals and captured the results. And this is from January of this year and very conservative numbers. Uh, we've shared the gospel in Kathmandu alone 4,950 times and seen 862 people turn to Jesus Christ, become what we call green lights or become new believers of Jesus. Out of that 862, almost all of them have never even heard the name of Jesus Christ before. This year alone, since January, just in the city of Kathmandu, we've seen 232 baptisms. And we formed 38 new, healthy, sustainable churches uh, that have an average uh, worship attendance of s over 600 new believers, all former Buddhists and Hindus. The multiplication has begun in Kathmandu. 
We also send four fields type of teams into the mega city of Mumbai, India, and we send multiple teams a year, and they see things that if you didn't see it with your own eyes, you wouldn't even believe it. In October, we sent a nine-person team from our church, ordinary people. Some were nurses, some were doctors, but they didn't go there to do medical mission. They went there to sow the seed of the gospel. And in five days on the field, five days of intentional ministry in the harvest field of Mumbai, when you factor in all the travel time and meetings, there was five intentional days in the harvest with these nine people. These were their results. They shared the gospel with 338 people, saw 210 of them turn to Jesus Christ. They had 10 baptisms in that five days. Three of them were former Muslims, the rest Hindus. Three of them were former prostitutes from the red light district, and they were able to rescue two of those women out of modern day slavery and repatriate them with their families. That was five days in a harvest field, just ordinary people doing extraordinary. Here they are here. <laughs> Blessed are the eyes to see what they've seen. Okay, yes, good. Jesus is worth it. Out of the Mumbai ministry, Hilltop of Hope was birthed. And Hilltop of Hope is a social enterprise birthed by Sugar Creek last year to rescue and restore women and children out of the red light district of Mumbai. The women rescued out of Hill, Hilltop of Hope, by a Hilltop of Hope, are trained in the same four fields approach that I've already talked about. And they go back into the place of darkness and rescue others with the gospel. And then we just had a challenge for them. These rescued women, these former prostitutes from the red light district, uh, they had a challenge called 30 Days in the Harvest from August 15th to September 13th of this year. For 30 days, they were challenged to share the gospel for 30 minutes every day in the red light district of Mumbai. And here's their results. They were stunning. They shared the gospel with 1,978 people, and they saw 552 people turn to Jesus Christ, become what we call green lights. They baptized six of those immediately, and they started three new churches in the red light district. It's stunning. In the past year, through the Hilltop of Hope ministry, we've seen 38 women baptized in one of the darkest places in the world. In the commons today, we're having a Hilltop of Hope story event, and, and every one of these bags tells a story of life change, and every one of these bags goes back into that ministry and funds this rescue and restoration operation called Hilltop of Hope. Next Sunday at Missouri City, we'll have a Hilltop of Hope story event there on that campus in the foyer. Let's get a little bit closer to home, Columbia, South America. Colombia has the largest amount of displaced people in the world, and there's over one million Venezuelan refugees that have migrated there, and even more to come. It's a historic uh, humanitarian crisis that's taking place, and it's also the least evangelized nation in the Western Hemisphere. About a year and a half ago, Sugar Creek launched No Place Left Bogota in the capital city of Colombia. It's a purposeful strategy to build a citywide network of multiplication leaders. You may have heard the term no place left that we've used in our ministry and mission efforts in recent years. It's a rally cry or a vision cry that comes around Paul's statement in Romans 15, 23, where he said, from Illyricum all the way to Jerusalem, there was no place left for me to continue this gospel ministry. So it's about these multiplication principles that we see in the New Testament. We launched that in Bogota with incredible results. And since we launched it over a year ago, we now have, in just Bogota alone, 90 new healthy, sustainable churches with over 700 new worshipers of Jesus and the multiplication of the seed of the gospel spreading all over Colombia through these leadership networks. We were recently asked by a major denomination in Colombia to help shift the paradigm of their churches to multiplication. So in October, we took over their four-day conference that they had in Bogota with 1,200 young adults from all over Colombia. We brought in our Spanish gospel teams and we conducted the gospel conversation training. And all these young people, all these young adults, 1,200 of them, they were scared and most of them had never shared the gospel in their life. We sent them out into the streets of Bogota for several hours. They were like sheep among wolves, but they came back rejoicing. 
And they had over 1,422 people turn to Jesus Christ. And they came back rejoicing at the very presence and the power of the living God and that the fields are ripe for harvest. We're now working with this denomination to conduct regional training and development of multiplying networks all over the country. Let's continue to get closer. Baltimore. Baltimore is a murder capital of the USA. In September, we sent a vision team from our church to Baltimore to cast vision for No Place Left Baltimore, and we let them experience the training and the fruit of the gospel, and they were completely amazed. So next year, we'll be launching No Place Left Baltimore and sending multiple teams as we share the gospel and, com and, and bring it combined with compassion ministry into, uh, into these public housing projects in order to slay the giants of poverty and, and drugs and, and crime-infested neighborhoods. And so that'll be taking place throughout next year. This is coming even closer to home, right here in the prisons near us. In 2014 and 15, I began training a select group of prisoners at Darrington Maximum Security Prison in Rose Sharon. And these same four fields principles that we've talked about already, these multiplication principles. In 2015, two of those men were transferred to Cofield Prison in East Texas, the largest in the state with over 5,000 inmates. When they got there, they surveyed the land of the prison, and they, they were only aware of four known Bible studies throughout the entire prison. They began to train these four field multiplication principles broadly, the same tools that we train in Gospel Conversation Training 1, 2, and 3. And the results were fascinating. In the four-year period, they have now shared the Gospel with 5,975 inmates, and they baptized 427 inmates at Cofield. They now have at Cofield 283 groups that function as church. They're not allowed to call it church, but it functions as church that meet weekly in every living area of the prison. The landscape and the culture of the prison is completely shifted. The same transformation... The same transformation that took place at Cofield is now taking place at Darrington Maximum Security Prison in Rose Sharon. In the past year, we have baptized 88 men in solitary confinement. The inmate leaders of these movements inside the prison walls say there's a direct correlation between the sowing of the gospel seed and the culture shift that's taking place inside the prison. They say there's a direct correlation between the sowing of the gospel seed and the amount of joy and the purpose for living that they are experiencing. Let's get real close to home. The gospel conversation training right here at Sugar Creek. These same tools and principles that we see producing an incredible harvest all over the world. We train here each month in Gospel Conversation Level 1, 2, and 3. And since we started that training in 2015, we've now trained 2,311 people in a six-hour workshop. And this year alone, we've trained 652 in a six-hour workshop. We're now seeing the gospel going forth through these intentional, gospel-centered relationships with people far from God in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our school campuses, in our social, social networks like never before. But the fruit, the fruit that we're seeing does not come from these principles and these tools, but through the Spirit of God when we have a posture of dying to self. Let's look at this film that shows Sugar Creek people experiencing this reality. Imagine the potential of one seed. By itself, it can't do anything, it'll die. But that seed is planted and given everything it needs to grow, it does what it's designed to do, bear fruit. Now Jesus described the kingdom of God and how it grows based on this basic principle of life. He says that a seed has to die to itself and be buried before it'll grow and produce fruit. And as followers of Jesus, we're just like those seeds. We're designed to produce fruit. And in order to do that, we have to die to self, be buried with Christ in a sense, in order to produce fruit that will multiply. This fruit is changed lives, people that God desires us to reach, people he rescues from darkness and brings into his kingdom of light, people whose eternal destiny is changed because of our obedience to the great commission to go and make disciples. This is how the church has multiplied throughout the last 2,000 years, and often through periods of great suffering and persecution. 
Jesus said the very gates of hell can't stop the advance of his kingdom. And we're seeing this simple principle played out today in so many ways in the body life of the church. We see it on the streets, we see it in the prisons, we see it on the mission fields around the world. We see men and women surrendering their lives to Jesus, dying to self, being bold with the gospel in places of great darkness. It all comes at great cost, personally, professionally, financially, mentally, spiritually. And the question is why? Is Jesus worth it? It's a provocative question that we need to consider in our churches in America. Really think about it. Is Jesus worth it? Is Jesus worth giving up our comforts, giving up our calendars, getting uncomfortable, pushing our limits for the sake of the gospel and making him known? Is it worth it? All that you're going to give up, all that you're going to face, the challenges that you're going to face, is it worth it? In Fort Bend County, in Houston, in America, our lives are very comfortable compared to the rest of the world. It's a challenge to break out of this comfort zone and get uncomfortable for the sake of the gospel. Right now, right where you're at, God challenges us to step in, to answer yes to this question, is Jesus worth it? To step into the river of his activity and surrender and yield to the flow of his spirit, say yes. And this is what we'll find, that God is real and he's alive and he's working signs and wonders and he's zealous to expand his kingdom. Yes, Jesus is absolutely worth it. And when we answer yes, we experience his presence. We find there's nothing better than to be in the center of his will. Yes is the safest place you can be. No matter how dangerous, how uncomfortable it may look, the yes is the safest place, most exciting place you can be. Whether it's in Nepal or Honduras or Colombia or Japan or Mumbai, India, we see men and women of our church giving up so much, sacrificing so much in order to be prepared for these mission trips around the world. They're giving up vacation. They're giving up finances. They're so prepared. They put in all this hard work. They travel for 20 plus hours on jets and go through all these time changes and jet lag and these different cultures. They work so hard for the sake of the gospel and get so uncomfortable. And the fruit that is a result is tremendous, both in their lives and the fruit that's produced in the lives that are changed. All the life change that takes place. Eric Fuentes is a member of Sugar Creek who led an extreme team to the mountain regions of Nepal where the majority of people have never heard the name of Jesus. This is a region of intense spiritual darkness, a region where over 15,000 young girls are trafficked every year into the red light districts of India. So this is definitely not your normal everyday mission trip. Uh, there's a, a reason why we called it the extreme team. It was monsoon season. So for an entire day, we spent being rained on constantly all day, muddy conditions. There was landslides that we had seen, rock slides we had seen, um, and there were gusts of wind up to 50 miles an hour. Um, just blowing through these mountain ranges as we were trekking through. So everything is completely soaking wet. Your boots are wet, your clothes are wet, you're wet. And then we encountered, I don't even know how many leeches, hundreds of leeches that you're pulling off of your legs constantly throughout the day. So now you're, you have blood dripping down your legs and, and that's all just to get to our destination. Everybody on the team struggled with something. Um, you know, there was one day where um, one of our teammates, they were physically exhausted and, and, you know, felt that they couldn't really go too much further. And through prayer, through some conversation, you know, um, they were able to keep going. Definitely not your um, typical mission trip. The joy of sharing Jesus with someone that never heard about him just eclipsed everything. Brent Cleveland's an amazing Sugar Creek member who has surrendered his agenda for Jesus' kingdom agenda and has been used by God to expand his kingdom all over the globe. To watch people come to him, come to know him, people that have never heard of Jesus and all of a sudden they're experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit. You're looking around a room of, of 10 people who had no idea who Jesus was and they're weeping under the power of God. Just a powerful experience like that just fills my heart with so much joy and it's the reason why we keep going back while we keep going out to do all these different things is because we live this. That's always worth it.
we decided to call it the Hilltop of Hope because this um, little first little sewing center was at the top of a hill and it was the only hill in this little area of the Mumbai Red Light District and it overlooked all the rooftops of just thousands of brothels and it just made you really think about this hilltop was just really the only Hilltop of Hope they had in that whole area. Hilltop of Hope is a social enterprise created by Sugar Creek to rescue women and children from the second largest red light district in the world and give them a restored identity in Christ. They're given a new way of living, a new way of loving, and are equipped with the skills to make the Hilltop of Hope handbags, which we then sell in the U.S. 100% of the profits go back into the ministry to rescue and restore women from the red light district. Nepal is a country that has never been conquered by an outside country. They live the way that they have ideologically for the last 2,000 years or longer. So when we walk in and tell them about Jesus, we're showing a whole new way of living. Over the past two years, Hilltop of Hope has seen tremendous growth and is making an impact in an area no one would have predicted. So many Sugar Creek members are working tirelessly, sacrificing so much to make this ministry successful. And as they die to self, they're producing a tremendous harvest of fruit in one of the darkest places on earth. Darrington is a maximum security prison located 30 miles south of our church. And for the last nine years, Gary Hill is one of the leaders spearheading our prison ministry there, and the fruit is tremendous. That unit was the worst, toughest unit in the state of Texas. Uh, 15 to 20, 25 years ago. Today, you would not recognize it. We've witnessed a gospel-centered movement spilling forth from Darrington to other surrounding units, completely transforming the spiritual landscape of the prison. One of the first men I met at Darrington nine years ago, his name was David Ludwig. If there were ever a modern-day apostle, he would be one. He was in for 40 years for, for murder. He was a gang leader. And so God took a guy who had been in a gang, committed a felony, put him in prison so he could use him. And David Ludwig transferred to the Cofield unit in East Texas. And he and uh, two other of these field ministers uh, began teaching the four fields, three circles model. And it has, over the past five years, radically changed that unit to see what God can do with one man who is sold out to him and committed to teaching others how to share their faith and to become godly men living for Christ. Phenomenal. Accepting Christ in prison is not an easy task. There's real world consequences for an inmate denouncing their former life for a new one. These believers in chains know to live is Christ and to die is gain, and they live it out daily. Men who are in gangs, who profess Christ know that their gangs are gonna beat them down. It's called getting black eyes for Jesus. And so when they make that commitment, there's gonna be abuse coming. And they understand fully their commitment to Christ and what it's gonna to mean to them. And one of, the, one of the most moving experiences was to see an African-American man who led an Aryan nation, white supremacist to Christ baptize him and come up out of the water and they hug. That was, that was a big deal. What started as a seed at Darrington has multiplied to other prison units throughout the state and is producing a harvest of changed lives inside and outside the walls of the prisons. Our prayer ministry has skyrocketed to include several teams praying and fasting over our mission efforts 24 by 7. Movements of God are only birthed through fervent prayer. A few people must pay the cost in prayer. And so many of Sugar Creek are now paying that cost, and the fruit of our mission has increased exponentially. Betsy McSweeney has played an integral part in this prayer mobilization that pleases the heart of God. Well, I wanted to go on a mission trip several years ago to India, where my uncle was born, and then he became a pastor. And he really impacted me about the greater picture. So I wasn't able to go because I just physically couldn't do the task. So I went home kind of crying and sad and started praying and I came back to Dawn and Teresa and asked if I could go on my knees while they went on their feet. 
and the results were just this increase in fruit on the field, but also at home, more and more people were being drawn to fast and pray, and more and more people were curious about it. And we tried to explain it's not a formula, it's a, it's a surrender. The colloquialism of all, all I can do is pray or just pray almost seems trite, when in fact, it's everything. It's absolutely where God meets you. It's where everything starts. It's where everything happens. Keaton Cook has been on staff at Sugar Creek for the past two years, and now he's selling all he has to move his wife and toddler to South Asia and minister to the unreached people groups of the Himalayas. I had this moment where I saw my wife just on our living room floor where all of our things are spread out before her, and she has these six bags that she has to put all of our belongings in. And literally, she's picking up each item, and she's counting the cost the cost of following Jesus to the ends of the earth. And she's looking at it and have to decide if this is something that we're going to take or if this is something that we're going to leave behind. One night that Alicia and I were looking at the vaccine list, and it's long because it's a third world country where the diseases are rampant, where our son, our little baby boy, who's one year old, could get one of these diseases that could just take him out, could take his life. And with each each act, each moment where she was having to make this decision, it was an act of worship where I could see in her that, that God was strengthening in her inmost being this desire for Him more than anything else this world could offer. And so we've got a question to make. Is Jesus worth it? We have a question to answer. Is Jesus worth it? Jesus said a seed must be buried and die to self but its death will produce a fruit that will last forever, a plentiful harvest of new lives. And we were able to share with a little over 400 people and a little over 100 of those people accepted Christ. We had several families came to know God um, as an entire unit. Last month, the whole Mumbai ministry had a challenge to each Mumbai Christian that said, for 30 minutes, uh, for 30 days, I want you to share the gospel. So in the red light district, they did that and they shared the gospel 2,000 times in the red light district to other prostitutes, and about 500 of them accepted Christ. At Darrington, the Spirit is piercing the places of deepest darkness, solitary confinement. At Darrington, in the past 12 months, we've baptized about 88 men that are in solitary confinement. This is totally unheard of. God is just flinging the door wide open for Sugar Creek Baptist Church. This is multiplication in action. And it starts with one woman or one man laying down their comforts and dying to themselves in order to produce fruit. You have yet to really live until you've really laid down your life and just said, God, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to, to, to do? You know, how can I, I join you? How can I be a blessing to you? And when he responds, just say yes. No words can describe it. Nothing more fulfilling. That's what I was made to do. As ordinary people at Sugar Creek have said yes and stepped into the unknown, the uncomfortable pushed themselves to the limits for the sake of the gospel. They've experienced the extraordinary, the very presence of the living God. And in the process, they've discovered a purpose greater than themselves, a reason for being, a love that is so alive and so real. What we realize in surrender is that His presence meets us there. And more than anything else that this world could offer us, sense of security, entitlement, belongings, the presence of the one true triune God is greater than anything this world could offer. We're created to produce fruit that lasts. Our only reasonable worship is to be a living sacrifice. What a hard concept that is. That's a hard saying. Yet when we surrender and yield to the prompting of the Spirit of Jesus, when we obey His commands to be the light to the nations, pushing the limits, getting uncomfortable, to make Jesus famous in our city, the America, and the nations, this is when we are who we were made to be. And the living God shows off through us. Is Jesus worth it? 
there's no doubt, yes, Jesus is worth it. Let's do this. Together, Sugar Creek, let's do this. Let's pray like never before. Let's give generously with joy to the mission of this church. Let's go with zeal and passion to proclaim the gospel of Jesus, and let's watch what God will do with a people that say yes. Let's go. In the third parable of Mark, the third agricultural picture story, the Alpha and the Omega says this, how can I describe the kingdom of God and what story should I use to illustrate it? It's like a mustard seed planted in the ground. It's the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of all garden plants. It grows long branches and birds can make nests in its shade. This little gospel seed is the humblest and smallest of all seeds. It's so simple and it's so humble that it astounds the brilliant. This humble little seed is a, contains the author and the power of creation. This little seed spoke and the heavens and the earth were created. This little humble seed was born in a manger yet became the most high king. This little seed contains the power of the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, that forgives you and I of our sins that separates us from a friendship with the living God. And this little seed contains the power of the resurrection that makes us brand new when we receive it by faith and empowers us in a new way of living, a new way of loving, a new way of being. And this little seed forms new Jesus communities, the church, that are the incubators of love and light on earth as we live this life out in community with one another. And this little seed brings forth compassion and biblical justice, slaying the evil giants in our communities and transforming entire communities and villages. Yet, this little seed makes everything new and brings forth life change. This little lady here, this picture was taken last year. She's in Kathmandu, Nepal. She's 104 years old, 104 years old. And this picture was taken right when the seed of the gospel was planted in her heart and she was experiencing life change and all things were being made new for her and she was weeping with joy right when this picture was taking place. And she told me this, she said this to me, she says, I've been waiting all my life to hear this message. What took you so long? All these numbers, all these stories are people just like her. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Isn't this what we were designed to do? Isn't this our purpose? Isn't this why we exist to love and lead all people to life changing Christ? Isn't this the secret of joy? Say yes. Is Jesus worth it? Say yes, shout it from the rooftops. Yes, let's posture ourselves before the living God and surrender and yield to his will and his desires and his agenda and his dreams. And let's watch the extraordinary. Let's give beyond measure. Let's give generously. In your bulletins today, there's an offering envelope just for the missions offering. Let's give to the mission offering above and beyond the regular giving of, to the church. This is a, a, a fragrant offering to the living God that pleases his heart. It states that in Philippians chapter 4. So we encourage you to give to this offering. Our goal is $760,000 uh, to the end of the year, and so we can't do it unless all of us give generously and sacrificially, in a sense. So whatever the Holy Spirit's doing, we ask you to fuel this multiplication through this fragrant offering to the living God. And let's go with zeal. Let's go with zeal and expectancy uh, into this mission, both locally and globally. As you came in or as you exit today, you'll receive this missions magazine, our 2020 missions magazine. In the back of it, it describes our, uh, all our training dates and our local projects, our share Saturdays, and also all our most of our 2020 short-term mission trips. But I'll encourage you to read uh, some of the content, especially pages four and five, that describe the thinking and the strategy and the way uh, th that we uh, process and decision-making filters that we use to fuel the investment of your resources that you give to this mission. 
And let's go, as I mentioned, with zeal and expectancy. And this Christmas season, let's each one reach one. Let's see each one reach one this Christmas season, planting the seed, that gospel seed, in one person's life. And then when we do that, we will experience the very presence of the living God, and we will experience a joy beyond measure. So I encourage you, uh, let's enter into that, that experience with the living God. Let's pray. Abba, Father, we rejoice that you are present here. We rejoice in the fruit of the harvest, Lord. Who are we that you would choose us for such a time as this to be used by you, Lord, in this incredible uh, harvest that's pleasing to you? We ask, Lord, for your provision, your presence. We ask that you raise up the resources from this church and continue to fuel the expansion of your kingdom. Use us as an agent of transformation in this city, in the Americas, and to the very nations, Lord, to the ends of the earth. We pray that you would raise up laborers from this harvest, Lord Jesus Christ, to go and plant your seed boldly. We ask, Lord, that this Christmas season that we give the extravagant gift of your love and plant the seed of life in at least one person this Christmas season. Lead us to the one, Lord. Each one of us reach one. We praise you, Jesus, for your presence today. We celebrate you and all that you're doing in and through us. We thank you all in the name and the glorious name of Jesus. Amen.